So without any further questions, let's begin. Jackson. Thanks for coming out tonight uh, to talk about what a lot of people find kind of boring, but I find very interesting. It's energy policy uh, in, in New York State. Um, also, by way of background, I, I joined NRDC um, in, on Jan in January of this year, so anything that happened before that wasn't my fault. I just want to make that clear. And there actually, in all seriousness, there may be some questions you even asked me since I've only been in NRDC a short time that I may not have the explicit institutional answer for, and if that's the case, I will indicate as such. Um, so let's just jump right in. There is a lot of information on, on my slides, but not as much as on, on Bryce's slides. Um, but both of us did that intentionally to kind of have our slides be a resource for folks to go back and look at later. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on each one. There is a lot of figures, there's a lot of information, um, but the intent there is for it to be a resource for folks to go back and take a look at later. Because as those of you who may have looked through the plan may have noticed, the initial brief is, is fairly easy to read and only about 70 something pages and each appendix is about 350 and there's three of them. Yeah. So we want to spare you the pain and provide you some kind of nuggets that are pulled out uh, that we both see as kind of being critical to, to take a look at. Let's see if I can work this way. Okay, so just kind of a, at a high level, I wanted to point out something that is actually uh, a, some good news for New York State, which is not the case in other regions of the country. And that's that we have seen uh, over the past, <clears throat> as you can see, I think the, the magical crossing point was about 2004. We have decoupled our economic growth from our, uh, our emissions profile and our, basically our, our, our CO2 emissions, our, our CO2 equivalent emissions per GDP, that metric, uh, is no longer tied to each other. So we don't basically, we're kind of, we, we, we're out of the trap and kind of the myth that economic growth has to equate to more pollution. And that's not the case in some other states that have more intensive manufacturing sectors, states like Kentucky, which is my home state where I was born and raised. Um, and so I just wanted to flag this as a, as a good thing and just kind of an indicator that New York is positioned to move forward with, with robust economic growth as we continue to actually reduce our emissions. Um, and then one piece that's in the plan, um, which again is a good thing, is that it reiterates the state's commitment to an 80% reduction by 2050. Um, and there's also a 2030 target, which I'll get to in a second. Um, the, the issue though, from, from our perspective, is that you can't, even a 2030 target, which is better than a 2050 target, still isn't enough to make sure we're on the right glide path. And so one piece that we, we're gonna be advocating for in the state energy plan process is to have interim benchmarks in the near term, you know, whether it's two to three year increments that ensure that we're on the right glide path to actually getting us to 80 by 50. Because um, otherwise, as government tends to do, if the, the compliance date or the target date is out 15 years, they'll keep pushing it out until it's 15 years away. Um, so just wanted to flag that. That's one key ask that we think is important to, to push for is near term and regular benchmarks to ensure we're on the right path to get our reductions to 80 by 50. Um, this is just to give a sense of, of greenhouse gas uh, sources by sector. I know it's kind of a busy slide, but um, one piece right here that is uh, key, you can see there's the transportation sector, which has been a, a big contributor. Um, I'm going to have some slides later. A really key takeaway, I think, that's, that's another bit of good news is that the, the New York State Climate Action Plan, which was, was, is still kind of an interim format, which was conducted a few years ago and utilized 2008 data, had some pretty persistent projections for the transportation sectors going all the way out to 2030, because that, that's always been kind of the sector that's the hardest not to crack. And it kind of kept getting bigger year over year and as a percentage of our overall emissions profile. And thanks to President Obama's CAFE standards, we now see that sector significantly declining um, over time, and it's literally a direct consequence of that change in CAFE standards. So that's a huge, important change um, that we're seeing. So it's not solved, it's not going down as fast as we want it to, but it's certainly declining much faster than it was even just a few <coughs> years ago when they were doing modeling before. Um, and this, again, there, one issue which I know a lot of folks that have been following this have been concerned about is the fact that the State Energy Plan has not released the greenhouse gas inventory yet. Um, or the, the energy efficiency and renewable energy potential studies. Uh, it is our understanding that those will be made public um, 
in the very near future. I don't know exactly what day, but we do anticipate them coming out fairly soon. Um, so I did want to reference the last kind of public data on greenhouse gas emissions from the, the, the climate action plan that I mentioned from back. Um, this is 2008 data. Um, this is mainly just to show kind of, again, just some macro perspective here. It's broken up into residential, commercial, and industrial. So that's basically our buildings. You can see that's a huge contributor to the red. Um, transportation, again, is the green. Uh, and then <clears throat> the power sector and delivery. And then the, the little bits here are waste and agriculture. So that's just a data point to, to look at that um, absent having the greenhouse gas inventory for the state energy plan available yet, um, it gives you kind of a macro sense. Um, Here's just some numbers on, again, <clears throat> also from this, the, the Climate Action Plan, not the State Energy Plan, um, that points out the way, one, a key point that might be a little complicated, but I'll try and simplify it, is that keep in mind, this is a state energy plan, and so it's focusing on combustion, power plants, buildings, etc. It's not a Climate Action Plan that this was, which is economy-wide, and so it's, it's a little bit confusing, but the numbers you're going to see come out for the greenhouse gas inventory and the discussions in the state energy plan actually don't include about 15 to 20 percent of the overall state greenhouse gas pie. And that's because it's a state energy plan and it's focusing on energy. It's not focusing on things like cement plants. It's not focusing on things like uh, landfills, uh, industrial processes. And so I just flag that as, as something to keep in mind as you're looking through the information. Um, so I already flagged on the chart earlier, one key piece is to have interim targets, so we make sure we're on the right track. The other one is that there's some, some lack of clarity in the plan right now, because it references carbon emissions and a, uh, a carbon reduction target. That needs to be clarified to, to be carbon dioxide equivalents, which would capture all greenhouse gases, including things like methane, SF6, and other greenhouse gases. So that's a, a key clarification. It's our understanding that's what they intended, but the language needs to be clarified in the analysis to be, to be sure that the state's pursuing all those. Um, <clears throat> now this is another piece that's from the, uh, again, from the Climate Action Plan. And this is what I was getting at before. This is the fuel combustion piece. So about 85% is what you can think of is kind of the, the emissions that are gonna be covered in the state energy plan, okay? The about 15% of the total greenhouse gas pie, so this is the whole economy-wide, the whole enchilada for New York State. The energy plan is addressing this 85% kind of combustion sector, but there is that remaining 15% roughly that's not going to be captured by the state energy plan, which again, I, I've said it a couple times, we need a strong state energy plan, but what we really need is to finalize and have you know, real teeth and real implementation of a climate action plan that is economy-wide, that is comprehensive, that ensures the state's policies are cohesive and are pursuing the same reduction targets. So, like I said, for tomorrow, let's get a stronger state energy plan, but don't forget that there's a piece of this pie that's not even addressed in the state energy plan that needs to be looked at. <clears throat> now, um, another piece of good news that is, is, is included in the state energy plan is there's a, uh, a mention of a commitment to energy efficiency programs in New York State through 2020. It doesn't include an actual a percentage target or how much efficiency we need to pursue. So it's great that it's teed up that we want to commit to energy efficiency at least through 2020. What we need to do is fill in the blank. We, we see a reasonable target to be about 2% annually of our demand can be captured through efficiency at, at a minimum. And so that equates to over time by 2025, about 20% of our demand in that year could be captured through efficiency instead of supply. So we're gonna be pushing hard to have that be part of the final plan. Um, another piece that's really boring, unless you're like a building science engineer or something, is building codes. It's hugely important. There's no more cost-effective way to reduce emissions and reduce energy demand across the board than by adopting and enforcing stringent building codes. Because what you're doing is you're capturing the whole universe of new buildings, and thanks to some new statute we got put in place in New York, we closed the loophole, so now any significant renovation will also trigger that more stringent building code. Because there used to be all this gaming that happened it was like, oh, what percentage of the overall structure is being renovated? Now it's pretty tightened up. The problem is we need to adopt the 2012 code, which we're still late on that, and then enforce it effectively and have municipalities have the funding they need to enforce it, because that takes resources, and doing so is one of the most cost-effective ways to reduce emissions and reduce demand for energy. <clears throat> now, again, I mentioned that the potential 
uh, energy efficiency potential and renewable energy potential studies, which obviously are a key consideration as you look at the state energy plan, have not been released yet, but they should be released soon. What is included in the, the plan itself, and the citation is down here so you can find it buried in the appendices, there are some preliminary results, and they're actually very, very, very encouraging. And we, we think that the, one of the key opportunities in the, in the comment process and in testimony is to hold the state to these numbers. Um, I know it's kind of small numbers, I apologize, but the really one that jumps out is you can see potential studies, for those of you that are familiar with them, is you kind of do a, a broad universe of what's technically feasible. You take that down to an economic number and then you take it down to an achievable number. So there's different degrees of how much efficiency is out there. But um, you can see right here, this is, I mean, this is striking. We're looking at, in 2030, 43% of our demand for electricity in New York State could be met through energy efficiency. It's a huge number. Um, and even on the, uh, the, uh, that's the, so that, that, that's the big number for 2030. There's other numbers here for um, natural gas efficiency. So the projected business as usual natural gas demand, 29% could be offset by efficiency. And then there's also one for oil. I think it got cut off, so sorry about that. But you'll be able to access these slides on your own as well. Now, so that's on the demand side, right? So we need to do everything we can to reduce the amount of demand for electricity and make sure we're using it as efficiently as possible. That's on the, the demand side. Simultaneously, on the supply side, we need to clean up the sources that supply that demand. So both sides of that coin are essential. You can't do just one or the other. Um, and so on the renewable side, again, for the first time publicly in the state draft state energy plan, there's a commitment that the state is going to support renewable energy through 2025. Uh, right now, the state's kind of foundational uh, programs for both energy efficiency and renewable energy are set to expire in 2015. Right now, um, every year uh, for the utilities in, in, in New York, excluding Long Island, uh, rate payers like you, consumers across the state, pay about $330 million annually into the renewable portfolio standard. That money's then reinvested in solar and wind projects. We likewise collect about $360 million annually that is in turn invested in energy efficiency projects. Those sound kind of like big numbers, but you always have to ground them in the fact that we spend $23.7 billion every year on electricity in New York State. I always tell people don't ever leave that part off when you're talking about clean energy programs because if you ground it in what we're spending on the status quo, it's a drop in the bucket. Um, and so those programs are set to expire in 2015. The Public Service Commission and the state are going to be looking to extend them. We think there's absolutely no reason that the state shouldn't adopt the 50% RPS target for 2025 and include with that the funding necessary to get those things built. Um, another piece here, which is, is kind of more down in the weeds on the policy side, but is just as important, you can't just get there by throwing money at these projects. We need to set up ways for projects that aren't getting built to get done. And, and one example of that that's happening in states like Colorado, somewhat in Massachusetts, is the idea of a shared renewables project. So what you would do is, who's familiar with net metering? Most, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And so net metering's great, but not everybody can put a solar panel on their roof. Maybe you live in an apartment building. Maybe you live next to some beautiful trees and there's a lot of shade. Well, shared renewables or community energy projects, what they do is you can build like a one, two megawatt solar project or wind project somewhere on a brownfield somewhere off site and then all of you could sign up and subscribe to that project and get credited for the energy generated by that renewable project so you get credit on your bill the same way you do under net metering but you do it from an off-site project that's a policy we're going to be working on aggressively this year in the legislature and in the psc um, some more good news we're on the verge of getting a 3,000 megawatt one billion dollar 10-year solar program approved at the public service commission this should probably happen in the next month. It's been a four-year campaign we've been working on. Um, and like I said, that's going to be one piece to the renewables efforts that need to get done. We're going to be pushing for that in the state energy plan. We think there's no reason we can't double the amount of onshore wind we have by 2015. We have the budget already in place, and there's, there's sites that are viable. We need smarter programs to implement them. And we need to keep pushing to have offshore wind and have the, the policies in place to get that done towards the end of the decade. Um, so, again, that was the efficiency potential on the renewable side. 
some more impressive numbers on the amount of potential by 2030 that we have. Right here you're seeing the, the hydro number is, is essentially, we have legacy hydro in place from St. Lawrence and Niagara that, that, that is kind of a baseline of about 19% of our electricity. But if you look here, um, the total right here in, in 2030 is 69% potential could come from renewable energy. It's a, it's a very impressive number, and there's no reason we shouldn't chase that and even do better. Um, so, and again, this is not, this isn't like my NRDC slide, this is in the state energy plan. And they need to be reminded of that and take these potential studies and actually adopt policies and components to the plan to actually achieve that potential. So, this is the, the, the aspect of the plan that I know has, has resulted in a lot of folks being pretty concerned that New York is moving in a direction that is not sustainable and that is over reliant on fossil fuels. Um, to give a little background on this, this is the, what they call the reference case. And so this just builds out, frankly, kind of a, a almost like an EIA, Energy Information uh, Association, kind of business as usual. You just plug in some, some load assumptions for how much demand there's gonna be and you just build it out over time. And as you can see, you come up with, in 2030, 36% from combined cycle gas, 5% uh, coal, 23% nuclear, renewables, I think it's five, right? Yeah, pretty bad, right? So I think understandably, folks have been outraged by this, this scenario. And I think it's, I mean, I hope, and I, I, we're gonna be pushing, that this isn't necessarily the plan. This is a reference case that they ran. It's kind of a business as usual if we didn't capture all that potential we just talked about. And so the, the important part is to connect the potential, connect that to a, another uh, case that they should run that shows what if. What if we capture that potential? What if we adopt the policies we need to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and transition to clean energy? And let's spit out those results. And that is absent from the plan, and that's a huge problem. And I think the State Energy Planning Board has been hearing that at every hearing so far. They're gonna hear it tomorrow. And I think hopefully it's going to result in them going back and, and kind of matching up that potential to an actual run. And I'm going to get to that in a second. We, we just did a back of the envelope of what, you, what, what this would look like and how it would change based on some more aggressive clean energy policies. So this is kind of our baseline, um, just as a figure. So 2012, this is what we're looking at right now. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it. You can look back yourself later. But it just gives you kind of a visual of the of the, the mix that we have right now for electric supply. Um, but you'll notice that the, the gas combined cycle, the gas combustion turbine, and the gas, gas steam are broken out into different pie chunks. But if you add all those up, it's, it's pretty gas heavy um, right now. And, and again, this is all just reflecting the, like the reference case, the kind of like the business as usual that's included in the plan. Um, this is in 2020. You see coal, uh, going down, you see gas going up. And then here's the base case model. This is the same as the chart I showed earlier, but it's just in a, in a figure. Um, again, it's even more gas heavy. You're looking at, because this is gas. The colors are kind of tricky, I apologize. Um, this is, it's easier to see on the computer, I promise. It always is, right? I apologize. The renewables is the one that you can barely see, because it's so small, 5.5%. Uh, so this is not the future we want. And that's what we need to let the State Energy Planning Board know. Um, I'm gonna skip over this because in the interest of time, but not because it's not very, very important. Um, as we clean up the, the, the mix of energy where we get our electricity, we need to expand the electric vehicle infrastructure we have in place and build out that infrastructure to reduce our reliance on oil and fossil fuels in the transportation sector. Um, again, I'm, running low on time, so I'm gonna skip over this one, but these are some key pieces that, that can help reduce emissions from the transportation sector. This is just reiterating new, uh, NRDC's position on fracking, which you're all familiar with. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you by reading it, I'll leave it up for a, sec leave it up for a second. Because I do wanna to get to the last slide and then turn it over to Bryce. So the... <coughs> This is what it looks like if we were to take some numbers that they had in the potential that was included that we went over earlier, 
and actually did a run. So like instead of just doing that business as usual, let's look at if you start to capture some of that potential for renewables and efficiency. <clears throat> so what we did is there was that 43% energy efficiency potential for electricity. Uh, we, we chose kind of a middle ground because that was the technical potential. So this is very, this is still conservative. It's a conservative run, I, I, we would argue. So a 30% efficiency, which means we're taking what demand would have been in 2030, we're knocking out almost a third of that through efficiency, right out of the gates. So you've, you've shrunk the pie for electric demand by almost a third in a more cost-effective way than building out new central gas plants or, 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 new, or whatever some fossil plants you build. So that pie has already been shrunk by a third. Then you take a 50% uh, renewables um, program and insert that. We didn't really tinker with the rest of the, of the reference case. We just kind of pro rat on a pro rata basis, just like shrunk what was left and kind of left those. We, we didn't, this was, this was literally the back of the envelope. This was not like a, you know, a detailed modeling exercise. We just wanted to get a sense of it. And uh, the next slide just kind of gives you a, a rough sense of what that looks like. So it's very different than what we had before. You can see here, this is actually, this 20% is the legacy hydro we have, the big hydro. And this is solar, wind, et cetera. So you're 50% renewables now. This is a lot prettier than that other chart, right? Um, and then you still have the, the, the nukes that are kept kind of at, um, we used the numbers that they had for Indian Point going away and just left the other ones in there just for this case. You could obviously tinker with that as well. And then you end up with 23% instead of almost 70 for gas in 2030. Now again, this is, we think this is, this is conservative to some extent because we, you could go further um, on both renewables and efficiency. But even with kind of a conservative take like this, it just goes to show you that throwing that up and putting that into a run is gonna give you a totally different outcome and this was missing from the energy plan. And so what, you know, from our perspective, it's great that there's great potential numbers in the plan, and we're gonna get that potential study to come out soon, and you can see more detail. The problem is we need to take that potential study, merge it with the actual runs of what our future's gonna look like, and come up with something that's an actual plan instead of just business as usual. And so that's what we wanna see happen, um, kind of at a high level. And that's it. <laughs>